Hi, this is Joe Chambers. Welcome to Musicians Hall of Fame Backstage from the Vault Series. These videos were made starting back in 2004, two years even before the Musicians Hall of Fame and Museum opened here in Nashville, Tennessee. We hope you enjoy what you see. If you do, please hit like and subscribe. It really helps. Hey, today's video from the Vault features the great Neil Young. I mean, I love the guys I play with and, uh, and and, uh, you know, the greatest honor really is to be called a musician. To be a pop star, to be a, a rock and roll star or a country star, it's nice and it's great. And it's, it's, you get a lot of perks and the whole thing, but, but the real honor is to be for another musician to say that, that they think you're a good musician, that they, that they like what you do, you know. Even though people think it's a Neil Young record, it's really just I'm the, I'm the, I'm the guy in the band that sings. And that's the way I look at it. I really like to look at all my records like that. The one, the one thing that I think is, that's really ironic is, is that in this business they take, uh, they'll take a new band and if there's a star in the band like, uh, you know, if, if there's a, a group like The Doors and Jim Morrison is the guy, you know, they'll try. The business people will try to separate the guy from the band and say, well, you don't even need these guys. It's you. You know, you're what it's all about. And, they, and so anybody who stands out in a band as being a star has to deal with all this pressure to stay, to, to leave the band on one side and to stay in the band on the other side. So that's, a, that's something that happens. Uh, and unless you're really in touch with being a musician and in touch with the people you're playing with and everything, you, you, you know, you got to realize that the, 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 the people on the street, they just don't know what's going on. They just don't know what's happening. They don't know that the Memphis Horns are responsible for so many great gold records. They don't know that uh, the Wayne Jackson uh, makes up these parts off the top of his head and they sit it, sit there in the studio and they lay down all these parts. And then, uh, you know, you hear, dun -dun 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 -dun, and you think Sam and Dave, but you don't, you don't, you think, hold on, I'm coming. You don't think Wayne Jackson, you don't think the Memphis Horns. You may, if you're a little bit of a musician type, you may think, well, that's the Memphis Horns but you're not thinking about the guy who came up with it. Now, those licks are just as important as anything else on the record. I mean, there's a group, the Memphis Horns. I mean, uh, they, they should be inducted into the Musicians Hall of Fame first. You know, that should, they, they have made so many records for so many other people with identifiable hooks that you can't disassociate. They're just integral to the, to the whole thing. And, uh, so I don't know how you're approaching arrangers, but they seem to get left out in both fields now. They, they're, they are musicians, and they're, not only are they musicians, they're master musicians, and they're organizing the musicians and helping them to work as a giant unit. And guys like Jack Nietzsche and, uh, and people like that are geniuses, and, and they, they, they need to be recognized. They need to be recognized because they, like a guy like Jack Nietzsche, he can't get in the Hall of Fame because he, he may have pissed off too many people, you know, because he, you know, he did so many things against the grain that all of the bigwigs for the Hall of Fame and everything, they don't understand, you know, that this is the core of, you know, this is, this is the soul of the Phil Spector sound. This is the soul of so many great records. Uh, this is the guy who wrote the, the riff for Needles and Pins. This is the guy who, you know, and okay, you think of da, 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 da. You think of these riffs. And you, you go, well, a bunch of guys were playing them. And it's like that Roy Orbison one that, uh, that the guitar player Pretty was woman. talking about for Pretty Woman. There's, there's riffs like that, but there's some, sometimes, like we know Jackie DeShannon might not have written that riff. It was maybe, you know, so it was Jack Nietzsche. So, you know, I think arrangers are important as well as the, as the producers and the engineers. You know, I, I really uh, pray for a renaissance of real of real homemade music where people actually play together and play off each other. And that, that to me, is, is what music's all about. And as we move in more and more into the digital age of Pro Tools and putting things on a grid and organizing things and sampling and everything, I'm not against, uh, you know, the rap and the sampling and all of the different things that are going on, the hip hop and all that, you know, it's cool. It's not my kind of music, but it's cool and it's creative. I'm not putting it down, but I am saying that when people play together, not not technically out of somebody's head through computers, but when they actually play together, that's a whole time that needs to be preserved. I know I'm mostly seen as a guy out front, but I feel myself that, that I'm, I'm most at home when I'm in the back line. I feel the best when I'm playing in a band and I'm not the singer, when I'm standing back there beside the bass player. 
That's that's why it's fun for me to play with CSN and things like that or other bands because where I'm not out front, that's when I really feel good. Buffalo Springfield, I was back behind, uh, you know, Crazy Horse. We did a lot of jams and it was just four guys playing. It wasn't like a it wasn't like a big uh, thing where uh, you know where I was out front all the time. And you know, so you know, that's where I really belong. You know, songs are are, are the vehicle. You know, and the, Musicians are driving it, and they're 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 going into the curve the right way, and they're 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 flooring it at the right time. And they're, but the song is the vehicle, and uh, you know so so the, the, the things all go together. But the problem is songwriters have been recognized. Like Bob Dylan's a wonderful yeah. songwriter, and a, a, you know irreplaceable part of American music, and and uh, there there's people like that. And they're recognized and everything, but on the other, on the same, by the same token, back there in those great records that Bob Dylan made in the '60s, you know, Al Cooper had a lot to do mm -hmm. with that sound on the organ and those little riffs that were on the organ, and, and that band and Bloomfield and those guys, they they gave it the sound of of, of uh, you know Fourth Street, that whole thing. They gave it that, so it wasn't just Bob. And this is what I I think the Musicians Hall of Fame is so great for is is pointing out these people. And putting them where they belong, right up there, alongside the the, the guys that everybody knows. And Kenneth Buttrick. Oh, what a I drummer! Mean, yeah, he he played a drum. He played a drum riff, and it was a a hook. He made a hook up on the drums. He played yeah. on Heart of Gold. He played the same thing. He played some cymbal thing. It's a signature sound that he associated with the lyrics, and he put it together. And these guys are just as important to what people hear. They take the song and they take it to a new dimension. I mean, you know, any of my songs that. Like Heart of Gold, it, it wouldn't have been a hit without Kenny Buttry. It wouldn't have been what it is, you know, and and, uh, and you can say that for almost every hit record. When y'all played here, and then you played in Atlanta right after that, mm -hmm. um, you did look like you were having the most fun in the world with your Les Paul and doing all those leads in, in like a Back there with band. Duck. Yeah. I was with Duck. Yeah. I always like to play with the bass player and the drummer. I like to be right in between the bass and the drums. And when those guys are out front singing, and Crosby sings so loud, it blows my head off anyway, so i got to stay out of the way of his monitors. But, you know, like when I'm in the back, I'm at home. That's where I live. That's where I want to be. You know, that's, that's, where it, that's where it's happening. There's a pocket back there. you got to cruise around on the stage and find the sweet spot and just stand there. Well, how about that, uh, um, oh, gosh, I'm, 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 I'm my memory, uh, Marty Robbins, guitar player, uh, uh, Grady Martin, mm -hmm. and when he uh, did on a song called Don't Worry About Me, the first fuzz tone, and that amplifier dropped a tube, and it was, uh, you know, so it made the, the it made the sound so that it was distorted and fed back, and that was the first fuzz tone, and they, they had to analyze that and figure out how to do that to make those fuzz tone boxes, but uh, if you listen to that record by Marty called uh, Don't Worry About mm -hmm. Me, uh, it's got the first fuzz tone on it, and that's you know Grady Martin. Now, nobody knows that you know today people listen to the distorted guitars and everything. You know they think uh, you know they they don't realize where these things came from. There's a history. It always goes back to some musician, right? You know. Well, uh, Pete Drake, as far as I know, he's he invented the top box, and yeah. he gave it to Frampton. Yeah. yeah. When he was playing on All Things Must Pass, Frampton was, said, "How I want my guitar to sound like that," and he's like, yeah, "Okay." Go ahead, talk into this and play mm -hmm. your guitar. I, I doubt Hendrix had any, any real influence, which is you, you were already happening and had your style. Oh, Hendrix was the best at uh, the uh, at being able to uh, to do his uh, his expression with his guitar. I'd say out of the '60s, uh, as far as, this, as uh, someone taking the guitar to another place. Hendrix was number one. There was no other guitar player came new came near Hendrix. Um, in the way he handled it, playing rock and roll three guitar, or I mean three three man band, mm -hmm. a trio, rock and roll trio, guitar, bass, and drums. He was so unique. So he had his own place, you know. Like uh, it was the Jimi Hendrix experience. And all the trios, there was nothing like the Jimi Hendrix experience. And and uh, the way they all played together, the bass player and the drummer, it was all three of them together that made that sound. Mm -hmm. Jimmy wasn't the same when he played with uh, the, the other bands. Or or, it or wasn't the same. Yeah. It was it was what happened when he played with those guys that made him free enough to, to
to express himself and to go to those places that he went with his echoplex and with his wang bar and all those things that he did and the distortion and the multi-amp uh, approach that he used, uh, you know, that vibrates the guitar to the point where if you stand in front of it, it's not that loud for you because it's behind you. And people in front of it get their heads blown off. But you, you, you got it, you, you know, so you just move the guitar out a little bit and let the sound coming out of the amp hit the back of the guitar and vibrate it and don't dampen it with your body. And suddenly the guitar just takes off like hell. So that's that's all good stuff. Nobody and I guess could... uh, J, J J Kale also. Yeah. If you, now you combine that with J J Kale, who's got the master's touch, uh, you know, and just one of the finest, most masterful guitar players. I mean, you can hear his influences on uh, Clapton and uh, and um, the uh, Dire Straits, uh, Knopfler. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's like they have obviously learned a lot. From JJ, and hardly listen. anybody knows who JJ is. JJ did a, a, enough songs so that musicians and people who are into music really know who he is. But somebody may listen to, and they don't know. You know, if you're really into it, and you're really into music, you know who JJ is. But the normal guy in the street that will know who Eric Clapton is, but won't know who JJ Kale is, or will know who Mark Knopfler is, but won't know JJ. They might you know. know he wrote cocaine or something. Yeah, or know. something like that. Yeah. Well, he's a defining influence. He, he, he really has got the touch. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, him, Jimmy Reed and Eddie Taylor, Jimi Hendrix, Hank Marvin, Lonnie Mack. Those and are the guys. Mitch Mitchell, really, he, he truly, like he said, he really was the only drummer that could have been with the experience. Oh, Manic yeah. Depression, I mean, that, that, that was another There's nothing like that. that. That was jazz. Yeah. That wasn't that was that was jazz rock whatever you call it, whatever you want but it certainly wasn't uh, you know uh, you know a big backbeat it yeah. was no backbeat there was no beat half the time I mean they're just all over it yeah and even and it was so expressive you can hear his they didn't even try to take the clicks out of his sticks when he was doing that because it was just it didn't matter it didn't matter right I just got back from Motown they were all jazz players and they would all go out and play at night in the clubs and you talk about playing off each other that's mm -hmm. they would come in and go hey. Remember that thing we did last night, you know? And then they would put it in a song. Yeah. And just it, a little bit of it. Yeah. Just a little touch of it. Yeah. And, and then they Robert turn it White. into a hook that just blew everybody's mind and, you know, laid it on over and over again. And when I was recording at Motown, um, which I did, you know, before I came down and was in the Buffalo Springfield, I was signed to Motown with the Minor Birds, and I was in there with Rick James. And uh, we recorded there, and uh, they, they really were freaked out by me. I had a 12-string, uh, a Gibson 12-string with a pickup on it, uh, acoustic 12-string, and I was playing lead on this 12-string. And this was like 64, I think. And, uh, and, uh, I, and, I, also, and I liked, uh, you know, to play the kind of things on that 12-string that were kind of like influenced a little bit by Steve Cropper and... Uh, and so, and a little bit by Hank Marvin, and but it was a 12-string, and it was electric, and it was weird, and and uh, they really dug that a little the pulls and all of that kind of country uh, thing that I was putting into the to the music. And a lot of times they they uh, when we were recording, they they'd stop, and the guy'd walk out, and they'd replace like three of us, you know. But they always left me, so I'd be playing with three guys from Motown, you know, the drummer and and the bass player, and uh, you know, and. Uh, and just on the sessions, and then uh, when you're doing the background vocals, suddenly there'd be three or four more guys there behind you singing, and they they pick it up, and it, so it had that sound because they just they just that's what they did, you know. They all played on everybody else's mm -hmm. records, and everybody did that. So, but they always uh, they always treated me really good, and uh, except for the uh, choreography class, I didn't do well in that. <laughs> they said they got paid five dollars a song. In the early days, whether it was took a day. How about that Barry Gordy? Oh, <laughs> what a man, truly. And but they finally, after that, they got a salary. I think up to two hundred something a week or something. But <laughs> <laughs> they gave me a contract this high to sign. You know, I signed with Motown when I was like sixteen or seventeen, maybe seventeen. I was underage, and uh, the the contract was this high. You had to sign everything away: publishing, writing, anything that you did was theirs. Just for you know, I was on Joe Bet, the mm -hmm. whole thing, you know, and uh, just because I wrote a couple of the songs with Ricky and uh, we did a few things together, you know, it's too bad that they didn't have film of the original sessions or how great those people were singing with the original people that did those songs and everything. But just the fact that you know that they were there and who it was and and that, that they were there, it's a, it's awesome to realize the power of that group of musicians and what they did. And that's that's another group of musicians that's 
there's them and there's uh, you know uh, Duck and and Al Jackson and, and, and the Stax group and, and and the Memphis Horns, that whole bunch and the Muscle Soul Muscle Shoals guys, mm -hmm. those guys played on so many records that I loved that it's scary. It's really scary.